Hello and welcome to Blast One's introduction to water jetting, water cleaning. As far as water jetting, water cleaning is concerned, there are specific standards we follow in relation to water jetting, water cleaning. Those standards are the NACE standard, which is SSPC SP12, WJ1-3, and also the Australian standard is 4233. Those standards are specific or relevant to what we're doing as far as water jetting, water blasting and water cleaning is concerned. So the key factor here, or the key word, is water. So what we ultimately are trying to achieve is a clean substrate from the water generated from a particular machine. This, this here is a, a mobile machine. Generally these will run up to about 5,000 psi. This particular one is 4,000 psi. It is identified on a tag or plate as far as the machine's concerned in relation to what its capacity is, how many litres a minute it does, which is relevant to what size nozzle we use in that particular machine. So all of that is irrelevant to the output and capacity of the machine. We need to understand what the machine's capability is in relation to what safety procedures and measures we need to take in relation to keeping us safe, doing the job appropriately, and also too, don't forget about the environment in which you're utilising this equipment. So there are consequences in relation to utilising water. Where's the water going? What is the contaminant on the substrate? What is the surface I'm cleaning? Am I getting an appropriate outcome? Is the equipment sufficient enough to do the job? All of these need to be taken into consideration prior to doing any water jetting, water blasting, water cleaning. As far as the environment's concerned, also too, not only the water runoff, but the water vapour, the mist that you create, it can go into uh, certain articles, items that should not accept water, such as cable trays, electrical equipment and so forth. So it's important you understand your environment prior to commencing a job. Do I need to isolate things? Have I, written, have I read the JSA written to that particular job, specific to that job? And there should be a specific job criteria in relation to water jetting. So understand those criteria prior to starting any sort of water jetting or water cleaning. It's important to remember that when you're projecting a stream of water, water is a conductor. So if you point water at an electrical item, it will travel back up the stream of water and the consequence of it, you're electrocuted. So that's why it's important. Isolations are in place. Everything is covered in relation to what are the consequences of what I'm doing. There's also a noise factor too. Water cleaning uh, the gas engine or the petrol engine here, it does have an exhaust noise. Also too, the nozzle in which it's selected for this particular type of pressure, it does have a noise factor. So those decibels are relative into what the environment uh, you're working in. So make sure that you are compliant in relation to noise, water runoff, and the consequences of my actions in relation to water jetting, water blasting, water cleaning. What is good about these machines are they are easily easy to manoeuvre, easy to put in place, and are quite adaptable to different situations. So as far as water cleaning is concerned, the most important thing with these particular machines is the water quality. So I use tap water or potable water as we call it, so it's drinking water. That's the criteria in relation to clean water. That's how clean it has to be. I cannot set a pump up over a dam and suck the water out of a dirty old dam and put it through this machine because it is detrimental to the fundamentals of the mechanics within this pump head. So you, you'll decimate or destroy this machine. So water quality is paramount importance. The way we've set this one up, we put a pre-filter on the tap and then run the hose through. So before I even endeavour to actuate this pump, what I will do is run the water and ensure that it is clean and the filter is not impeding the water flow because the important thing is these pumps cannot run dry. They can't run out of water. If they do run out of water, it's detrimental to the seals and the pistons and the valves contained within this particular pump. So the pump itself has water coming through it, so it mean, means I need a primary drive. And as I say, in this case, I have a petrol or gas engine. You can have diesel engines. You can have electric to drive that particular pump. 
The good thing about this particular machine is there is no electricity because water and electricity don't go together that well. With that, most of these machines where the water flows through, this one doesn't have what we call a reservoir, so it doesn't hold water prior to it going into the pump. So the pump's doing two things. It's receiving the water that you're sending from the main, but also too, it has to rely on that water pressure to maintain fluidity within the pump itself. So with this particular pump, what we need is a good water stream, water flow, primarily because the output of this particular pump is X amount of litres per minute. Every manufacturer will state that this pump has a capacity of maximum PSI, maximum litres per minute. So in this instance, we've got a filter on the main where the water is coming from. But where the water comes in here, there's no reservoir, there's no holding of water. So what could happen is if somebody ran over the hose and pinched the water supply and the pump continues to, to um, generate fluid, it starts to starve of any liquid so the fluidity within the pump is reduced to such a degree that it becomes detrimental to the operation of the pump. It'll actually cook the pump. So in general terms we have to make sure that the water flow is maintained throughout the operation of this pump. If it starves for water, it can cause what we call cavitation within the pump. So it gets a pocket of air in there, and the pocket of air can be quite detrimental, particularly to brass surfaces, O-rings and so forth. So without a reservoir, it's important we maintain the flow of water. How long would I have if I ran out of water with this particular pump? You only have a few seconds to switch the pump off. That's how quickly it decimates the internal workings of this particular pump. So with all of these pumps, we make sure we've got consistent water flow to the pump because it has to receive the water. It's not designed as a scavenger pump. It's designed to, to pressurise the water and send it out to me, not pick up the water and then push it out because that's two jobs. Primarily, we want it to do one job. So we make sure that it has sufficient water flow. So water quality, filtration of water prior to entering the pump will ensure longevity of the pump itself. You'll notice here that we've also used a mince up or A type coupling. So you'll notice where, the, where I've connected this particular pump. We've got a A type coupling, coupling as well as the nylon garden fittings as well to, to accommodate the securing of the hose. But always we still use our safety clips to ensure that it can't come undone. If I had a bigger or larger water supply hose, you'll find that the use of plastic fittings is diminished and we would normally screw them straight into a steel tail or a hose tail with a clamp. Primarily because there's more pressure behind a larger hose and it increases the volume of water. So it's important that you read the description and safety instructions in relation to these particular pumps because sometimes they might say you need a half inch and not quarter inch hose. You might need a three quarter instead of a half inch hose and so forth. So if you read the instructions prior to utilising this equipment, it does two things. One, it ensures the longevity of the pump, but two, and more importantly, it ensures your safety as an operator in utilising this type of equipment. Whilst we look at it and say, well, it's only a water blaster, it still has the capacity to inject me with water. So even the low pressure water cleaners that you see at the car wash and so forth, if you're close enough to the the nozzles that uh, are utilised with those particular pieces of equipment, they still have the capacity to inject you. So this is no different. The other aspect of this, of course, is how many litres a minute it does. So in relation to how many litres a minute it does, these working parts here get quite warm. This is why we have a cage around this to, to eliminate people putting their hands on the, resting their body parts on there. This is no different to any other piece of equipment. There is standard safety equipment that's needed in relation to its operation. It's noisy, so you probably need earplugs. Well, there's no problem, you can use ear earplugs, earmuffs. You would need a visor, some safety glasses. And the most important thing is you would need protective clothing, gum boots, steel cap boots, and gloves. But as far as water injection is concerned, there isn't a glove that's going to save you from 
a water injection from a, a nozzle, even as something is uh, similar to this machine, which is 4,000 psi, it still has the capacity to penetrate any fabric you put on your hands, gloves, rubber, whatever, to inject you with water. So in that regard, as far as these are concerned, you'll notice the lance is a certain length on these. Well, that's to make it comply with standards. The standard is the length has to, of this lance has to be at least 1,200. Why do they make it a certain length? Well, if it was short, can you imagine the ability to be able to point it at myself? So the whole idea of this, you can see the handles here and the end of the nozzle is up here. So you see, I can't physically shoot myself with it. But what you can do, if you're not careful, is run it across your feet. So that's why we wear steel cap gum boots or steel cap boots. And you can get a spat that goes over your boot as well if you're concerned about it. So there's a, a, a shoe cover or boot that's aluminium that can protect you in that regard too. Particularly if you're looking at doing drains that are close to near your feet. But common sense prevails. If I'm going to work an area near my feet, of course, I'll step back, take a stance so I don't fall over, pull the trigger and work away from myself, not toward myself. So the lance is designed in such a way that I can't shoot myself. But the triggers on these particular guns, on all water jetting, water cleaning equipment, they're what we call a hold to activate device. So they have a safety. As you can see, the safety normally drops down to eliminate the depression of the trigger. But if I clip that back up out of the way, I can now depress the trigger. But if I let the trigger go, it stops. That's what we call a hold to activate. So I have to hang on to that to activate the nozzle. Now, having said that, the one aspect of any water cleaning unit that'll undermine its integrity and deem it unsafe as well, is an act called triggering. So once I start water blasting, it's important that I depress the trigger and maintain depression to do the job. So what I'm saying is you don't look at a job and say, okay, then I'll give it a squirt, depress the trigger, depress the trigger. Because for every action you have air here, there's a reaction down here with the pump itself. So the triggering that I mentioned is something that you don't find as a habit, triggering. Because every time I let this go, the pressure that's in this line that stops at the gun here has to go somewhere. So I build up pressure and by letting the trigger go, the pressure is still maintained and built up in here. It has to go somewhere. So in these particular units, we have what we call an unloader valve. So the unloader valve, what it does is when the pressure builds up, up around the maximum pressure of the pump, it'll start to dump the pressure. So the unloader valve, every time you pull that trigger, it's spring loaded. So it comes home and allows you to maintain pressure. When you let the trigger go, the unloader valve will wait until it builds up sufficient pressure and then it'll start lifting off the seat. So it's held by a spring on the seat. So every time you let the trigger go, the pressure will build up in the pump, then the unloader valve comes into action and starts unloading the pressure so that you don't have an increment of pressure to the stage where it's detrimental to the pump and it explodes. That's what an unloader valve is designed to do. So if you trigger this particular unit, the pump itself is going, trying to unload, trying to unload, trying to unload, and you're wearing it out prematurely. So what I suggest you do is Arrange yourself to do the job, walk up to the job, pull the trigger and hold the trigger on to, do, to complete the work without triggering on and off, on and off, on and off. And that's indicative to all water blasters, not just small ones, also and more so high pressure units up to 40,000 psi. So when I say you have to depress the trigger and hold it on as long as possible, well of course if, if you have to stop and move, there's nothing wrong with letting the trigger go moving or if there's an incident or you can see a potential hazard occurring, of course, let the trigger go. But then you need to come back to the pump and release the pressure or turn the machine off. So on all of these machines, there's the capacity to increase the pressure or decrease the pressure. 
Now with most of these type water blasters, there's a small cap that covers a pressure gauge. It's mandatory that they have a pressure gauge on them. Most of them are what we call liquid filled. So they've got glycol in them with a glass front. That's why the cover's on there. Now the glycol is put into the gauge to hold the needle still. So because it's liquid filled, it assists in holding a secure reading from the needle. So say for example, it wasn't liquid filled, the needle would fibrillate to such, such a degree that I couldn't read what it was telling me. So they liquid fill these for that reason. So if the liquid runs out or this glass is damaged, you need to replace it. The other aspect of it, of course, is that it's got a venturi entry in the back of it where the water pressure builds up and comes through into this chamber. So if you lose that glycol, break the glass, damage the gauge, there's a consequence for that too because the water can, has got somewhere to escape and will eventually push all the glycol out of this and you can't read what it's doing. So if you damage this gauge, what I am saying is you need to replace it immediately. So the cover's on there for a reason. Will I leave the cover on there all the time? Of course not. If I'm trying to establish a pressure, remove the cover and you'll increase the pressure gauge to establish what pressure you're after in relation to or what's consistent with the job requirement. So the cover's there for a reason. So what else do I need to know about this here? We've got three valves, three pistons, and what we call an oscillating cam in there, which I can show you with a cutout. And the cutout is indicative to what's inside this pump. So because this one's not cut out, everything's sealed, of course. So the important thing is there is maintenance involved with these, these machines, such as checking oils, and that is oil to this pump. And there is a specific viscosity of oil that you use. So the daily maintenance requirement of this particular machine is, of course, your oils, your wetted areas. So what are, are they in this instance? Well, we've got gearbox oil for the pump itself, which is checked daily. And it does have an identifier on the stem to show me how much oil is in there. One thing that does signify premature wear on these machines is the fact that if the oil stems and seals within this pump are undermined, worn, this oil that I'm checking now is the right colour as it's, it shows clearly on the stick itself. If the water was penetrated into this oil gallery, this would be milky. So if you've got milky oil, nine times out of 10, you'll find that you're losing pressure as well. So there's a problem with the seals and this pump needs to be repaired. Can anyone repair the pumps? I'd suggest you use the recommended repairer or supplier in relation to the pump itself if you're not proficient with the mechanics in relation to these pumps. So the oil has to be checked daily in the pump and also to check the oil in the motor or the primary drive for this particular unit. So here you are, you see you can check the oil to make sure that's right. Ensure that all this is level prior to trying to check these things. So just make sure the little O-ring on the bottom of this is wiped clean and there's no debris on the outside of the pump body prior to undoing this as it may be dropped inside and become detrimental to the crank bearings, seals that are maintained within this pump itself. The newer model pumps also have what we call a low oil cutout. So if this particular drive motor is low on lubricating oil, it won't start, the machine will actually shut down. But there is no solenoid wiring or anything like that on the pump itself. So that's why it's imperative with these pumps, you check the oil daily and always only operate them on level ground. So as far as keeping safe, checking oils, making sure that everything's done up tight, sufficient clean potable water to drive the pump. There's one other thing we need to attach here of course, which is the water blasting or water jetting or water cleaning hose. Now, with all of these, up to 10,000 PSI, you'll find that 
these particular hose fittings have a stem and on the stem is an o-ring so that stem and o-ring fit inside the pump outlet the thread on these are normally bsp which is a coarse thread which enables quick tension and quick release of these fittings now before i put these fittings in there what are, there's two things i have to make sure of there's no debris or contamination within the hose. If there is, it will be detrimental to the nozzle or tip I'm using on the end of this particular hose. So as far as these pumps are concerned, these have a specific working capacity as far as pushing water through. This particular pump 16 litres a minute. So you imagine 16 litres a minute and you leave a bit of dirt in here, it'll soon block up that nozzle. So there's two things I do with these hoses. One is I'll rinse it, use it utilising this hose, or I can do this. I'll put some Vaseline on this O-ring. Why would you do that? Well, this is brass, this is steel, and you can see that it's got that gingering effect, so there's inherent corrosion in relation to that. So by smearing some Vaseline on that edge and on this edge here, does it matter if I block the hole with Vaseline? Absolutely not. So it's imperative that I rinse this hose to ensure that I've removed any debris, contamination, dirt, dust, grit from this particular hose because it'll ultimately jam up my nozzle. It does deem the whole thing unsafe if you've got a blocked nozzle because then this will pressurise and again, you're asking the unloader valve to dump the excessive pressure. So if it starts dumping, that grit could remain within the, the premise of this housing and then ultimately go through the entire pump. And that's the same, it's indicative to the supply line as well. If you don't rinse that primary supply line of water and you pump grit, dirt and rubbish contaminants through the pump, the pump won't last any time at all. So in, in that regard, if you use dirty hoses, use dirty water, you undermine the integrity of the pump, its longevity is diminished, you really only got yourself to blame. So as far as this steel insert's concerned, what I normally do is I rub some, or place some Vaseline on it, but also too, in this fitting as well, I'll apply a liberal amount of Vaseline. It doesn't matter if it blocks the hole because Remember, you're using 4,000 psi. It will soon blow a bit of Vaseline out. It's not going to hurt the tip or the nozzle. So the Vaseline, there's an O-ring in the back of that stem. So the Vaseline keeps the O-ring supple and keeps corrosion at bay. So it's a lubricant in that regard. So I do that every time I take that hose out. But you've got to remember, every time you take that off, I've got to rinse it as well every time I go to use it again. So it's best to keep this as a closed, what we call a closed line. So this fitting remains on the pump unless you deem it necessary to remove it, to, to stow it. But if I do that, I'll put a cap on the end of here. It doesn't matter if it's a bit of plastic or even a bit of duct tape, it really doesn't matter. But ultimately you'll cover that up. Because if you do get antibodies or contaminants within this particular line, it can deem block the line and the line can actually balloon with the pressure or the blockage, which undermines the integral wall of the, of the hose, but also too it could explode and get you. So as far as this is concerned, I can pop that on there, screw it up, and that little bit of Vaseline on that brass makes all the difference. Now, I've mentioned that this machine is 4,000 psi. So here's an imperative aspect. The machine is 4,000 psi, but oh, is the hose rated to 4,000 psi? It's mandatory that you check that. Now, always on these hoses, they'll have a maximum pressure. So a WP and pressure. And it'll be in two ratings. It'll either be in bar or it'll be in psi. So just remember that one bar is 14.5 psi. So if it says bar and you think, well, what's that in psi? 
Well, I don't know. I've forgotten what he said. Was it 14.5, 14.6? I, I can't remember. All you have to do is take the cover off the gauge and the gauge will tell you. PSI versus bar. So most of them are set up like this so that we can do that conversion quite quickly. So just remember, look for the identification plate on the equipment you're using, establish what its maximum PSI is, primarily because that's indicative to the type of hoses that we connect to this machine. So as far as this machine is concerned, this hose rating here is 315 bar. 315 bar. Well, well, what does that work out to be? The 315 bar is about 4,000 PSI. So this hose will have a pressure rating on it. So this hose is married to this machine. The first thing I'll check is, what is the PSI or pressure rating or burst pressure on this particular hose? So in this instance, it says here 315 bar. Well, 315, the maximum pressure of this machine is 3,000. Uh, sorry, the maximum pressure on this machine is 300 bar. So the burst pressure on this in PSI, 315 bar, that's 4,576.5 PSI. So I'm well under the capacity of the machine in relation to the pressure rating of this. So what you'll find is that your hoses that you use in relative terms have a higher rated pressure than what the capacity of the machine is. Why do we do that? Because if the machine peaks, spikes, this here has the capacity to maintain that pressure or harness that pressure within the hose without bursting. So just to reiterate on that again, the pressure, the maximum pressure of this machine is 300 bar. This hose is rated to 315 bar. So there's more than adequate pressure here, pressure control to harness what this pump can deliver. So remember that checking that, the pressure of the hose, You'll also find that on the lance, it's also written on the lance what the, the dangers are and what the maximum pressure of that particular lance are. It's always written there. So to ensure that you're safe, you will check that to ensure this maximum pressure, which is 330 bar, is indicative to the hose pressure and cons consistent with the compliance plate in relation to pressure ratings. So one, two, Three, they all have to comply so that you ensure that you maintain safety. What I would never do is use a hose that's less than the pressure rating of this. Because these hoses are like a hydraulic hose. They've got a wire braid around them with an internal line on lining. And then you've got the swaging or the wrap on the outside of them. So it's important to remember, I can't crimp this hose. If I put a crimp in it, it's deemed unsafe and has to be removed from sight, cut and put in the rubbish bin. If there's any abrasions, significant nicks out of the hose, again, it's deemed inoperable and removed from the machine. If you manage to bend this lance, a small bend, a minor radius, it's deemed unsafe, primarily because this will be 316 tube. And because 316 is, is not a pliable metal, if you bend it too much, you undermine its integral wall strength. And again, there could be an accident or incident. So if you bend them, you need to replace them. These fittings on here, this is what we call a quick release. Now you'll find the quick release here in, here in smaller units. You won't find this once we go to 7,000, 10,000, 20,000 PSI, primarily because this is deemed safe up to 10,000, or 7,000, sorry. You go to 7,000 above that, that's when you're asking a bit too much of that particular fitting to hold that pressure. So is there any pressure here? Well, of course there is because there's back pressure from the nozzle and when you open the trigger, there is still maintained pressure within this line. So the same pressure that's running through that hose runs through this lance. 
as a consequence of water passage that's, that's relatively quick, it can become quite hot, so it can heat the water up. So that's what this is for. It's actually just a safety device to reduce the, the possibility of it burning yourself from this lance getting warm. Now having said that, this is a cold water machine. But I can actually pump or supply this machine with hot water, but only up to 60 degrees. Any more than 60 degrees, and the seals and the pistons in this pump can't cope with anything hotter than that, and the seals will actually umbrella themselves, and the machine will cease to function. So remember, 60 degrees is the maximum I can put into this pump. So sometimes, yes, I may need hot water or warm water, to remove grease or whatever the contaminants may be on the surface that I'm trying to remove. So we have a lance that complies, fittings that comply, hoses that comply, the hose must be rinsed. So I can attach the hose like I've done and I can run the machine without the gun attached. Would the hose whip around? Basically, the nozzles on these particular machines are quite small. So the nozzles on the machine are the thing that give you the pressure. It's exactly the same as holding your finger over the hose, over a garden hose. So if I hold my finger over a garden hose, you'll notice that if I just let it spray, the water just runs out. Well, basically that's what this does without a nozzle on it. But you'll notice if you put your finger over the hose, you create a restriction and the water starts to fan out and there's more pressure and it goes further. Same concept, same, same. So that's what the nozzles do in these machines. They reduce the water flow and increase the pressure. So whilst this machine is pumping water up, it's hydraulically pushing the water up to this particular nozzle. And because it's only got a tiny hole to come out, it slows the water speed, uh, the water flow down, but increases the speed of the water. So does that make sense? It slows the water flow down, but increases the speed of the water. Same as when I put my finger over this hose. So that's the concept, so that's why when you're utilising this particular nozzle with the trigger depressed, you don't put your hand or face anywhere near it because it will inject you. So what's the consequence of a water injection? Well just say for example I did shoot myself or hit myself in the foot or the leg or the finger. Oh well it doesn't matter, there's no blood coming out. To be quite honest with you, that's worse. Because there's no blood coming out, that means that it's been a massive impregnation of water within my skin. So I've actually just injected myself. That's a serious injury. Because we use potable water, it doesn't mean that all the microorganisms within the water have been removed because I've got a filter on there. I've actually injected water into my skin that's got these microorganisms in them that can spread through my body relatively quickly. So the hazard is quite substantial. So if I inject myself or hit myself on any part of my body, again, that's treated like a snake bite. So it has a pressure bandage and straight off to the hospital. So you need to tell them and inform them that I've just injected myself with high pressure water. That's a serious injury and it must be dealt with immediately. So remember, a pressure bandage on it, whichever part of the body you've hit, contact the ambulance or the emergency services and alert them to what you've just done, irrespective of how minor you think that damage is. So if you follow that procedure, and hopefully you never need to, you, you've got a good chance of surviving that particular injury. So when you're selecting nozzles for this particular machine, how do I know which one is right? Well, you see, with all of these pieces of equipment, you'll get a manufacturer's instruction booklet. So there's lots of information in here about what the machine does, what its capacity is, so it identifies what the model number is, and so forth, what its maximum pressure is, how many litres a minute, what's the maximum temperature input of water you can put in there, uh, suction height, 2.5 metres, so it'll suck water. What we said earlier too is try and prevent that, help the machine by assisting it with water pressure feed so that you don't run the risk of cavitation. What it weighs, the recoil, uh, and the recoil at the lens. So that, that means, here we are, the recoil at the lens. What on earth does that mean? 
So that's the inertia. That's what pressure comes back onto you from the lance, from the gun itself, when you depress the trigger. So it's 62.8 Newton metres. So luckily, 62.8 Newton metres is well inside the Australian standard as far as inertia or reaction force is concerned. So in relation to what this spec says, it's all quite compliant. If you're unsure about the information that give, it's given on here, ring the supplier, or of course you can ring the manufacturer because all the details in relation to who to contact is written on here. Most of the people at Blast One would be able to help you. So if you ring the service desk and said, look, I'm a bit unsure on this, they'll help you out because they understand what all this chart means. The other aspect of this particular machine too is the nozzle sizing of this particular machine. It's found in several different charts. So let's have a look, 270 bar. If we follow this chart along, it tells us how many litres a minute, which is 16. But it also gives me a range of nozzles. So it says 00045, 15045, 25045 and 40045. What that's relating to is the nozzle size is in thou, so it's 45 thou, but it's 0, 0, 0, 0045, so that's what we call a pin jet. So that's just one pointy jet like this of water. Then we get a variation again like 15, 0, 45, 25. Now we're starting to relate to the dwell angle. So that's the fan width within the nozzle itself. So it's 15 degrees, 25 degrees, 40 degrees. So all of these variables are in relation to what the job is and what nozzles are available to me. So it starts from a pin jet, comes out larger, larger and larger. Why do we have that? Well, it depends on what sort of job you're doing. Whether you need a wider scope, a narrow scope, or a pin jet to remove debris between two confined items and so forth. But remember that there's always a rebound factor. So when you hit something with water, there'll be a rebound factor. The rebound, we, we combat that by using visors, safety glasses underneath the visor. We'll use our waterproofs, steel cap gum boots, a pair of gloves and earplugs to ensure that debris doesn't get in our ears. So there's a plus with the wear and earplugs is that if there's any rebound or debris floating around, of course, it, it can end up in your ears. So the earplug will eliminate that. Also too, when you're water blasting, there's a thing called, I mentioned it earlier, a bit of mist. That mist, it's so important that you identify what is on the surface. So let's say, for example, you were washing something down, water cleaning, water jetting, something that was mouldy. You're actually atomizing what's coming off the surface. So if it's mouldy or mildew, it's imperative that you wear, now have to put a respirator on or have an air wash hood or an air wash mask. Because those mould spurs or moss that you're removing, you're atomising them and putting them in the atmosphere. So you can actually, or you will as a consequence, ingest them. So you're breathing in mould spurs can make you quite ill. So this is why I'm, I keep referring back to the safety aspect of it. What is the consequence of what I'm about to do? Well, I'm water blasting, what is the environment? What am I cleaning? What am I removing? Say so for example, it's lead, asbestos, all those sorts of things. Identify the substrate before you attempt the water blasting job. And it's the same with all of this equipment. Make sure it complies, it's been checked, and the maintenance is performed periodically within the machine. And then of course, I mentioned the daily checks. So let's go back to the nozzles. So on this particular gun, we've got a gray back nozzle then we've got a red back nozzle, and then we've got another one here which was green. And look, so there's, there's a, an immense variation in nozzles. So these nozzles here, they're what we call turbo nozzles, or weed cutters, or dirt busters. There's all different types of, and variations of names they are. All they are is a spin jet. So when the water comes through the back of here, it hits a planetary. And in that planetary, it diverts the water through to gear this particular spin jet. So the jet starts rotating 
and they, and they spin at quite a, quite a significant rate. So the whole idea of that is, that by the rotation, its cutting, of power is, is cutting ability and power is greater. So it's, instead of being a finger jet, it's actually it's still a finger jet, but it's doing this with quite significant speed. So the one thing to watch with these fellows is, of course, with all that fine gearing in there, you don't want contaminants in there. And also, too, it's not the type of thing that you push debris away with on the end of the lance because you will damage the outer housing. The moment any of this is compromised by damage, it's no longer usable. It's non-repairable, a lot of them aren't. When you get into the higher pressure stuff like 20, 30, 40,000 PSI, they are repairable. These smaller ones are designed to do a specific job and they last for quite some time if you maintain them. So what would I do to maintain it? Some have nylon gears, some have brass gears. The best thing to do when you're not using it is put a cap in there so that debris can't get in there, dirt and so forth. Or just tape it up, both ends. Bit of tape around there, it's all good. But you see these different colours here, they represent what they are. So we've got a, a 09, a 08, and, and uh, the one on here, which is 06. So all that's doing is identifying the pressure and an identification number from the manufacturer. So the manufacturer's book tells me what it does. But also too on all these, and it's mandatory, it'll be written there, maximum 320 bar, which equals 4,500 PSI. Maximum 80 degrees C, that's hot water if you tend to put hot water in them. And so on, it tells me the same, same again, how many PSI it is. But also too on these, it's important when you get them new, if they've got a part number on them, write it down. So in my little manual here, I'll write down the part numbers of ancillary items so that if I need to replace them, I've got some information in relation to replacement. It helps when you ring the service desk and say, I need a particular part. You've written it down, you've logged it. Makes it easy for everybody. And that's what life's all about, making it easy for everybody. So let's have a look at this one here. Look, it's a completely different shape. Well, this particular nozzle here is not only a pin jet nozzle, but it also has the capacity to fan for me. So what I can do is put that on the lance and twist it around, and it opens the orifice even bigger. Why would I need that? The main reason I need that is because when it becomes a larger hole, I can actually put on the bottom of this machine a capillary tube, a suction tube, and I can put that into a detergent. It's important that I make sure the detergent corresponds with the manufacturer's recommendations because you don't want caustic detergents running through your machine because it'll undermine the integrity of the pump. But normal detergents can be run through this, liquid detergents, sucked up through here when you open this valve or this nozzle to a different setting. So it'll click around and it'll be a larger hole. So what it does is, your flow rate remains the same, but the pressure's diminished. And the minute the pressure's diminished, it gives the pump the capacity to suction feed that detergent up through the nozzle. So that you can spray detergent over the substrate and then click it back into place so that you've got a jet and now rinse the detergent off. They're relatively simple, they work well, but again, they must be clean and always check the detergent container to make sure there's no contaminants in there. So if you do all of these recommended recommendations, comply with the recommendations that I've just set out, you'll ensure the longevity of your pump, but more importantly, you'll stay safe. Water's a great tool It'll never create profile on the surface unless it has a complement of an abrasive with the water stream. But that's an alternate type nozzle arrangement as well. In these smaller pumps, it's what we call a gravity hopper that feeds the garnet in there, which assists in the cut of what's on the surface. But they do a great job there. They have a specific job and they set out in the manufacturer's recommendations, book. Also too, remember if you lose your book, you can always ring Blast One and say, guys, I have this particular machine. Can you help me in relation to where I go from here? And they'll 
see if they can source another book for you or help you out of trouble on the spot. So if you maintain lubricants in it, keep it fueled, keep it level, out of harm's way, you'll get many years of service out of these particular machines. So I hope that you've got something out of that information. What we're going to do now is we're going to actually connect the water, let the water run free flow out of the hose before we connect it to the lance, and then we'll initiate the, the power stream that this spin jet head has, and we're going to wash another smaller machine here before we start to commence work on that. 